The Gospel reading picks up where we left off last week in the so-called Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel. Hear what the Spirit says to the Church. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all it is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. This sermon begins with a message from the Surgeon General. Warning, hearing this sermon may be hazardous to your comfort. Pregnant women, people with high blood pressure, and those hoping for easy answers should avoid prolonged exposure to the words contained herein. I thought I should warn you about this in case hearing this sermon Ah, turns out to be as uncomfortable for you as writing it was uncomfortable for me. I want to begin with an image that is probably familiar to most of us. Picture the old federal courthouse just across the street here. Some of you will remember when that building was the post office, not the courthouse. Folks used to meet in the lobby to visit and to catch up on the latest news around town. Now it's the uh, bankruptcy court, I think. 25 years ago, in, in the courtroom of that building, on your behalf, I received an award from the Historical Society for the preservation and restoration of this old sanctuary. And for many years, under the aegis of a pious and sympathetic chief judge, who also happened to be an Episcopalian from across the street there, we had access to the federal parking lot every Sunday morning and every Wednesday night or whenever we would have an evening meeting. The sergeant of arms actually came to the church and handed me a key to the gate to the parking lot. Back then, the federal courthouse was an inviting place, accessible, decorated with murals painted by artists during the New Deal. It was a building whose doors were open to citizens of all stripes. When plans were announced that the federal government was going to take the whole rest of the block and build a new courthouse, I was uh, assured by federal authorities that this openness and neighborliness would continue and the downtown denizens would even get more parking spaces and we could could park on Sunday mornings close by. Then came a trial of defendants in a big drug trafficking case. The sergeant at arms showed up and took the key back, and we never saw it again. A security officer suggested that during the trial, would it be okay if snipers were posted on the top of the education building? 
We said that's not a very good idea. And then came the bombing at the federal building in Oklahoma City. And then, of course, the horrors of 9-11. The old courthouse still stands, but it is no longer used for ordinary trials. Those take place in that huge edifice that was built on the northern half of the block after the new courthouse was built, somebody pointed out that it didn't actually meet the federal ADA requirements for access to by home by handicapped people. So the feds had to build a, 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 a big ramp in front so that if you were in a wheelchair, you could actually get to the front door. Nobody thought of that when the building was being constructed. And there is a small parking lot between the old and the new, which is not accessible to the public. Not even jurors are allowed to park there. Now, I mention all this not to stir your righteous indignation over having to walk a couple of blocks to get to church. Uh, a lot of folks who live in big cities do that already. I mention it because this story of the, the two courthouses, it seems to me, is a telling metaphor for our times and a warning to the Church of Jesus Christ. Courthouses are supposed to be symbols of stability and law and, and justice, and they're supposed to be places where the public's building, the public's business is conducted, and the rights of citizens are guaranteed. They used to be inviting places, welcoming places. For years when the Copelands would take a long uh, trip in the car, I would avoid interstate highways so that I could drive around the courthouse in every county seat on, on the way to where we were going. This drove the other passenger in the car a little bit crazy, but I really enjoyed it. On the lawns of those courthouses, you could still see nice old guys sitting in the shade of a live oak tree playing checkers. It, it, was, it was a great thing. When a courthouse comes to resemble a fortress more closely than the public square, when the government builds a cordon around its courts of justice to fend off its own citizens, it sends a very clear message. We're afraid of you. We don't want you here. Stay away. And my great fear is that the church of Jesus Christ is headed down the same path. In the 58th chapter of the prophet Isaiah, he delivers a clear message to God's people. It is possible the prophet says, to observe all the niceties of liturgy without actually pleasing God. The people in the passage can't understand what's gone wrong. They follow their, their bulletin. I mean, they, they say amen when they're supposed to, or most of the time they say it when they're supposed to. They they even refrain from turning the page after the prayer of confession, which is, shows a, a lot of spiritual discipline. Still, the, I, the uh, prophet Isaiah says, says, God is not impressed. Well, why do we fast and, and you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? The Lord responds not with the condemnation of corporate worship per se, but with the clear message that corporate worship by itself is not enough. Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, Bring the homeless poor into your house. When you see the naked, to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin. 
This oracle links the political dimension of faithfulness to the personal. Not only are God's people called to correct unjust systems, to end oppression, to break every yoke that confines humanity, we are also required to engage with neighbors face to face. There's a link here between the abstract and the concrete. Corporate worship that flows decently and in order is not enough. And even political action is not enough. Along with worship and action must come personal engagement. Just in case you missed it in this passage, and believe me, I tried to find it, the prophet does not say, give money to a soup kitchen, but rather share your bread with the hungry. Not support your local homeless shelter, but bring the homeless poor into your house. Not drop your cast off clothes at the Salvation Army, but when you see the naked, cover them and do not hide yourself from your own kin. You've got to put them all together, Isaiah says. Corporate worship, political action, personal engagement, anything less is unworthy of God. Now, it is easy to mitigate the offensiveness of this text. After all, in Isaiah's time, there were no social justice institutions, no shelters, no social workers, no safety net, however tattered and ineffective. I mean, what did Isaiah know about the danger of enabling codependency? Had Isaiah ever dealt with a manic, depressive, homeless person who refuses to take medication? Would Isaiah have brought an addict into his house with his children? If Isaiah were to show up at First Presbyterian Church tomorrow, he would find the front door of the education building open. He could come in and use the restroom, use the phone at the end of the hall. But in order to talk to a human being, it would have to be through a locked door. He'd have to ring the doorbell first. And these days, it seems hospitality can't be allowed to trump common sense and security. A few months ago, I was asked by a neighbor, by a minister at a neighboring church, I won't say which one, he wanted to know if we would contribute to a fund to hire uniformed guards to circulate around downtown, around the churches on Sunday mornings. That request put me in mind of a day back in 1986 when a young woman named Elizabeth Mapstone showed up, literally showed up at the church door. She was without a place to stay, out of money, lonely, and in floods of tears. A church member named Dorothy Rose was in the building that day, and Dorothy did not hesitate to bring Elizabeth home with her that day. Elizabeth found a job, joined the choir, became a youth sponsor, a full-fledged member of the church family. She, she went to FSU, earned a degree in math education, went off to New York State, and married a nice man, and has raised a family. Isaiah himself could not have prophesied a better outcome. The point is, other institutions in our society are circling the wagons, patrolling the perimeter, checking their security systems. We are becoming a culture of enclaves, even of armed camps. Our great institutions, the courts, the banks, the museums, 
are installing surveillance cameras in every nook and cranny, and the most desirable neighborhoods are the ones with a guard at the entrance. And you can be sure that as the presidential campaign heats up, there will be loud and fervent cries to build that wall. And this is all the more reason, it seems to me, why the church must remain somehow open to one-to-one, face-to-face engagement with neighbors in need. Without that engagement, our beautiful worship offered behind closed doors, bolted against people who are not like us, will be no worthy service to God. God is not fooled by liberal Christians who love humanity but can't stand people. In her history of the church, Barbara Rhodes tells us that when this sanctuary was built, rifle slots were included in the foundation. You can still see four of them. Our ancestors were concerned at the time about being attacked by Seminole Indians. As it turned out, the church was never attacked, at least not by marauding uh, bands of Seminoles. That was back in the 1830s. In the 2020s, the church is again under siege, but The greatest danger is not posed by people who are homeless or poor or looking for help, not even threatened by the actual lack of parking spaces. The greatest danger is that we will forget who we are. Isaiah tells us very clearly, and so does Jesus, we are light. When we turn toward neighbors, our light breaks forth like the dawn. When we turn away, we hide that light under a bushel basket. We are salt mixed with all manner of people. We add flavor, but on our own, we are not good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden underfoot. The year was 1993. You can tell as I approach retirement, I keep going back into history and experiences. We were gathered in the sanctuary for the Easter vigil. Back then, we we were very strict with ourselves. The service started at 11 and lasted well into midnight. And for that reason, the choir and I had nothing to worry about. We had the people in the pews outnumbered. There was nothing to worry about. We entered the sanctuary in the dark, bearing the paschal candle. Douglas Seaton bore it up here. We we read the passages. We sang our hymns, and it became time to reaffirm our baptism vows and celebrate the Lord's Supper. And a figure rose up in the shadows from the pew back there. It was a man from the streets, ragged and dirty, and I suspect not altogether sober. I just want to thank you folks, he said, for making people like me welcome. And I I think I said something like, well, brother, we're, we're about to have the Lord's Supper. Won't you stay for supper? He didn't answer. Service went on. And I saw him wander down the aisle, and he approached Tim and Carla, Tim Hookman and Carla Connors, It's hard to believe this, but Daniel was just a little babe in those days. He's over six feet tall now, but then he was the smallest and the youngest person in the room. This man pulled out a coin out of a a grubby pocket and handed it to Carla and said, for the baby, so he'll remember this night. I think he left sometime during communion. And a while later, Carla told me about that coin. It was an old British haypenny, the kind of coin that hasn't been used in Britain since they decimalized back in 1971. How that man had that coin that night, I'll never know. 
There is a custom in the Jewish community, but before the Passover meal, the youngest child in the family is sent to the front door to open the door to check to see if Elijah the prophet might be there to hearken the arrival of the Messiah. Who knows what Elijah looks like? Who knows whether the stranger at the door might be Elijah or the Messiah himself? Chills run down my back every time I, I remember that story. And I remember telling it to a group of pastors on a continuing education event. And I'll never do that again. Because one of them looked at me with alarm and said, Well, where were your ushers? I can tell you for sure somebody like that would never get past my ushers in my church. I got the feeling he had lots of parking spaces as well in his church. <laughs> well, remember I warned you at the beginning of this sermon that it might make us all uncomfortable and I do not have all the answers. But I will let Isaiah and Jesus have the final word. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom shall be like noonday. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under a bushel basket but on a lampstand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way that your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.